to our performing arts scene. <laughs> Hey, as always, we look forward to giving them those opportunities to uh, share their gifts and their talents with us. And, and I promise you that we're going to continue to watch them to grow and to develop throughout this entire school year. I am ready. Let's jump back in. Uh, we have in our services been going through uh, principles for kingdom living. And we have been using the Gospel of Matthew as sort of a jumping off point for our discussions and talking about these principles. Now, I have, I have made myself a promise that I'm going to try my best to do better with time. And so if, if, if y'all feel like I'm rushing or if I cut it short, then that's why. It's because I got to make sure that you all are, are getting back to class on time and, and teachers can trust that when I say I'm going to finish at this point, I'm going to finish at this point. But nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, I enjoy this. This is a, a passion for me and, and something I, I enjoy doing. So it's, it's always hard to put the brakes on when you're doing something that you love extremely well. Amen? Yeah, I got to get me an amen corner, by the way. Y'all didn't, y'all didn't grow up in the South, so y'all don't really know what an amen corner is. That, that's the part of the church that's always saying amen. So I got I to gotta get me an amen corner. Sixth grade, you all going to be my amen corner? Yes. Amen. Yes. All right. Yes. <laughs> all right. So we're looking at understanding the kingdom uh, and principles for kingdom living. So here's our, our big question for today. We've been talking about How does a kingdom lifestyle differ from a worldly one? Because basically that's what Jesus was doing in this section of Matthew that we're in right now. He's been presenting a kingdom lifestyle, and he's been showing how a kingdom lifestyle is different from a worldly lifestyle. And it's a mind frame that we have to have if we're really going to have a strong relationship with God, if we're really going to live our lives for Christ, and if we're really going to influence the earth with his kingdom, we have to know our proper framework for living life in this earth. And so if, if you have your Bible or if you need to go with me, it's in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. We're going to take this, we're going to break it apart, we're going to go however long time allows us to go, and then whatever we can't finish, we'll finish it next week. That way we can take our time and make sure that we're getting an understanding in everything that we're doing. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you openly. Now, last week we talked about the power and the importance of prayer and why for a kingdom citizen prayer is such an important thing. But you can't talk about prayer without also talking about fasting. And remember how we talked about the fact that a lot of people push prayer aside? And the reason why a lot of people push prayer aside is because, number one, they never see the results of prayer because they've been taught the wrong way to pray. Secondly, they don't really understand prayer. And when you don't understand something, you're least likely to engage in doing it. So we took prayer apart and we discussed it from various perspectives last time so that we can get an understanding of what prayer is and why it's so important for us to pray in our lives. Something that gets pushed to the side even more than prayer is fasting. And fasting even more so because how many of you like to eat? Any of you looking forward to skipping lunch today? Probably not. In fact, aside from maybe PE and and recess or whatever your funnest elective is, you probably have lunch as your second favorite course, uh, if not the first one. Nobody likes to skip lunch. Nobody likes to miss a meal. And, And so when it comes to fasting and giving up food or giving up drink or giving up things for a certain period of time, we push that aside even more. But you can't pray regularly without without also fasting regularly. Jesus basically was saying this. He was saying in essence that, that kingdom citizens discreetly sacrifice themselves for the sake of knowing and being used by God. There's a very powerful reason for why we fast and why we pray and why we do those things together. Now, I'm not saying you have to, pray, if you have to fast all the time. You don't fast as much as you pray, but fasting is equally as important as fasting. If you fast as much as you prayed and you're praying how you ought to pray, then you probably ain't never eating, which isn't good for the kingdom either. But there are times when you have to be led by God's spirit in order to begin a fast, and we want to be obedient to that. But Jesus is saying that kingdom citizens, we give up ourselves for the sake 
of knowing and being used by God. We make whatever sacrifice we have to make because that's the most important thing that we can do as kingdom citizens is to know our God and to be used by him. So here's some points on, on fasting I want to share with you real quickly and we'll move on to our next point. What is fasting first off? Fasting is an intentional restraining from physical pleasure for the purpose of making more of ourselves available to God. Now, if you forgot your lunch at home and you missed lunch, that's not fasting. Because number one, it wasn't intentional. You just forgot your lunch. So fasting means I am intentionally talking with God and communing with God, and I'm pushing aside physical pleasures for the sake of focusing on him. Let's make a little bit more sense today. Here's a statement I got to make, and I really want you to stop and think about it for a minute because it might fly over your head if you don't really get it. But listen to this statement. You are spiritual beings having a physical experience. You were a spiritual person before you were a physical person. The Bible says he knew you even before he, he built the earth, even before the foundations of the world were laid, God already knew you, which means that your spirit already existed in him. So you were already a spiritual being before you were a physical being. Your spiritual being when you were born just took on a physical body. You are a spiritual being having a physical experience, but sometimes we get that backwards and we think that we are physical beings and every now and then we have a spiritual experience. We experience God in some way. God gets us excited in some kind of way. We feel the spirit move in some kind of way. We make it as if the spiritual part is temporary. No, it's the physical part that's temporary. Everybody in here, raise your hand. Everybody. All right, if your hand is raised, one day you are going to die. Put your hand down. One day your physical body is going to die. The physical is temporary. Your spirit, however, even when you die, your spirit will continue to exist. You are a spiritual being having a temporary physical experience. So you are spiritual. Now, the Bible tells us something unique about God, too, because the Bible says that we were created in the image of God. We were created in his likeness. And the Bible says that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him how? In spirit. And where's my amen corner? In amen. spirit and in truth. Am I right? Amen. In spirit and in truth. So God is a spirit, so we have to worship him in spirit. Why? Because part of us is spiritual. We're spiritual beings. So that part of us needs to connect with God because it's how he puts life inside of us. So we are spiritual beings having a physical experience, not the other way around. So the spirit is important. Here's another point. Whatever you feed will grow. Whatever you feed will grow. Now, you've read your Bible, and you've ran across this word called the flesh. The flesh usually refers to your physical body or your physical impulses, the thing you feel, lusts and pleasures and anger and emotions. All those things make up your flesh. Well, if you constantly feed your flesh, then you're going to live your life according to your flesh because your flesh is going to overwhelm your spirit. In fact, the Bible says that the lust of the flesh war against the things of the spirit. It fights against the things of the spirit. So if we're always feeding the flesh through entertainment, through pleasures, through lust, through acting out in anger, through disobeying God, if we're always feeding our flesh, then our flesh is what's going to begin to grow. This is where fasting and prayer becomes even more important because whatever we feed will grow. If you're always feeding the flesh but never feeding the spirit, then you're going to behave like a fleshly being. You're going to behave like you have, as the Bible says, a carnal mind. So in order for us to be able to grow spiritually, what do I need to feed, the physical or the spiritual? Come on, amen, Kona. Amen. No, you're supposed to answer the question. <laughs> we want to feed the spirit. Thank you. If we want to grow spiritually, we have to feed the spirit. So here's our third point. Fasting re restrains the physical experience to enhance the spiritual. The reason why we set aside that time to refrain from eating food, to refrain from taking in drink, to refrain, refrain from engaging in pleasures is because we are restraining the physical in order to enhance our spiritual experience. There are times when this body just gets in the way. 
your spirit, when it's in perfect union with your body, can do some amazing things. In your Bible, do you remember after Jesus had been resurrected from the grave and he'd come back alive, the Bible says that his disciples were in a room and they were in a room praying and the door was closed and the door was locked. But yet somehow Jesus came into that room with a locked, closed door. He was able to just come into the room because his body and his spirit were in perfect union when he was resurrected from the grave. There was another time when he was sitting down with his disciples who he was walking with on the road to Emmaus. And the Bible says that when they sat down to eat, that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And as soon as he did that, his disciples' eyes were open and they recognized him. And the Bible says that he vanished in thin air. He had a different body that was resurrected and glorified and his body and his spirit were all working properly. And this can sound like some spooky stuff. But there are things in this world, there are things to come that we haven't experienced yet that we see experienced in the life of Christ. But you got to remember, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. So fasting helps us to restrain the physical experience to enhance the spiritual. Here's another one. The more of ourselves we make available to him, the more he will use us. So fasting allows me to make more of myself available to God so that God can use more of me. It's really that simple. We can talk about the deep stuff, we can talk about the spiritual stuff, we can do all those things, but here's the simple point that I'm trying to make. The more of you that you make available for God, the more he's gonna use you. The more you have ears that actually hear the voice of God, the more you have eyes that can actually see God working, the more you're able to hear him working and operating in and through your heart, the more you experience him, the more you open yourself to him, the more he will use. So some of us never experience God. Number one, because we never pray. Some of us pray and we still don't experience God because number one, we don't ever fast. We don't ever make ourselves more available to him. We sit down and we do our cookie cutter prayer, we get up and we move on. That's not experiencing God's presence, that's just giving him a grocery list. But if we're going to live for God, we have to give ourselves to him. Amen, Amen. there you go, we, we with it now. So moving on, in, in, in verse 19, it says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. 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 So kingdom citizens live kingdom-focused lives. Kingdom citizens live kingdom-focused lives. Remember, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you put your treasure, if you value the things that are simply in this world, your money, your possessions, your, your, your friends, even your family, if you treasure the things in this world over God, you would never have a great experience through him. If you treasure status and power over God, you'll never fully experience him. So kingdom people live with their lives focused on the kingdom. Remember that, that verse, and we're going to bring it up a little bit later, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That word seek means to study. It means to pursue, and it also means to be preoccupied with something. So kingdom people are always focused on how do I do this to serve God? How do I use my talents and my abilities to serve God? What do I need to learn? How do I need to grow? How do I need to develop in order to be able to serve God? So we cannot love God and the world. We can't love them both. We can't love them both. Let me see if, if there's any um, bold students in here. And I don't, I don't uh, want to embarrass you and I don't want to condone any, any, any actions or decisions, but, but how many of, of you guys in this room have what, what you would probably refer to as a girlfriend? One. Man, y'all are sad. I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
So let me ask you this question then, because because you don't want to answer me, and I know why. It's, it's because you got more than one, and I'm just kidding. I'm going to leave you all alone. Let me ask you something. If you had your girlfriend, and she found out that, that you had another girlfriend, would she be pleased with that situation? No, she wouldn't, would she? She wouldn't be happy with that, would she? Because she wants you to love her and to love her only. She don't want you to love her and all the other girls that you meet. Just her and herself. That's what you look like when you're trying to love God and be in love with the things of the world at the same time. It's just not possible. You can't have both of them. As the old people used to say, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You got to choose which one you want to do. So we cannot love God and the world. The Bible puts it this way in James chapter 4, verse 4 through 5. It says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously? Everybody say jealously. jealously. He learns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. That scripture says that when you fall in love with the world, that you make God your enemy. Now, the Bible says that if God be for us, then who can stand against us? In other words, if God is on your side, there is nothing that can hinder you, nothing that can stop you, and that's nothing anybody can do about it. But now, if God is your enemy, then you're on the flip side of that. You don't stand a chance. You can't win. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You can't breathe. You can't do anything, the Bible says, apart from God. God grants you your victories and your defeats. Amen. Amen. <laughs> y'all doing a good job, by the way. I appreciate that. At least y'all paying attention. <laughs> so the Bible says that if we love this world, that we would make ourselves enemies against God. Here's another point. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. In the, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the dark? That, that scripture can sound confusing, but it's really not. It's really not that confusing. Here's simply what Jesus is saying. He's saying check your vision because it's not that the light is the problem. An eye is simply an organ that perceives light and tells your brain what you're looking at. It just feeds information to your brain. And what Jesus is saying is that there is no problem at all with the light. The light is everywhere. But if the thing that you have to perceive the light is not functioning properly, then your whole entire life is dark. And what does that mean practically? Practically, that means this, that God's wisdom, God's knowledge, God's understanding, God's ways, God's voice is everywhere. He's always speaking all the time. But if you don't have a heart to discern God, if you don't have a mindset that is able to discern the things of the Spirit, then you are living your life in total darkness. 